will take these poems once they've been prepared and curate them into the collection. I take the bones, put them on the turntable, and photograph them as they go around. And then I Photoshop them and add them to the computers so that they have a 360 degree view. So anyone can get on to the catalog and just watch them. The research we're doing is primarily taphonomy. Taphonomy covers everything from what the dinosaurs were doing when they died, how they died, what happened after they died. It's a pretty comprehensive study, very much like crime scene investigation. We use high precision surveying equipment that's GPS based so that we can make multiple measurements on each fossil to determine their location in three dimensions to within a centimeter. And that way we can then use the computer to reconstruct a virtual quarry. With that we can look at the distribution of bones and that may tell us something about how they happen to come to that location. activities besides digging up dinosaur bones and one of the highlights of the trip for many students is the spiritual aspect we pray together we have worships in our course lectures we emphasize not only the nature of the dinosaurs but also about the aspects of creation that are important to us all Because if creation is not a valid account of origins, neither is the sacrifice of Christ a valid account of salvation. You don't see this every day. I don't care where you're from, whether from California like I am, Thailand, Africa, New Zealand, and wherever. We have an opportunity to discover history. You're a city girl, city guy, city old guy, city young girl guy, whatever you are, just come, all right? out of bones any time in the near future. I will continue to work with it as long as God gives me that ability. Would you please stand with us as we sing our opening song?
Father, we thank you that we could all gather here today as friends and family. We pray that you will be with those of us who are unable to make it. Be with our speaker today. Please guide and protect us throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Now time for us to take up our tithes and offerings, um, and I'd like to ask for the deacons to please stand. Father in heaven, we're thankful, dear Lord, that we have this opportunity to return part of you, what you're bl you blessed us with, glory and honor, and for your use here and around the world. We ask that you receive it and to bless it, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Please join us as we uh, begin our praise service. You can stand, you can sit, you can do whatever you like. Just join us and uh, sing uh, a couple of our songs. We're going to start off with Come Now is the Time to Worship.
Congregational prayer. If you have the slip that I mentioned earlier filled out, then I would encourage you to meet me here in the front. And if you don't have a slip filled out, but you have a burden on your heart, then I would encourage you to come forward as, as well. like to invite everyone who's able to kneel with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful, dear Lord, that we can be here on the Sabbath day to worship you. And we are thankful, dear Lord, for our speaker that we have today, that he brings to us wisdom and knowledge and, and a clearer understanding of you. And we ask for your blessing on him today, dear Lord. And we think also of these prayer requests that we have and we ask for your blessing to be on those who have asked them in, in a very special way. We ask dear Lord for the Holy Spirit to be here with us as we worship you and we just ask for you to fill our hearts 
And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, and verses 3 through 7. And the scripture there says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were made of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Amen. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sorry, and I'm happy to be here. My wife and my family being here with me today. We drove in from Albuquerque, New Mexico last night. We live in New Mexico now. God has uh, directed my pathway to New Mexico after living here in uh, Amarillo for such a time. Um, before I get started with this song, because I have a lot of songs in my heart, but this one is probably one that touches me the most. Um, it would be about, it would be about, uh, uh, well, November the 9th would be almost two years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And that was enough bomb, but when they said that I had aggressive cancer, that was a, a, another second bomb. And, and, it, and, it, and, and I can say today that, um, I shared many tears. I, I never, I thought I shared tears until I heard such a thing such as that. And, um, but the most thing that I got out of that is that I heard the Lord told me that I would be with you. And so if, if whatever you do through these things, I'm going to be with you. And so that, that would encourage me in having the support of my wife and my family behind me and the church family here that those that had heard about it was praying for me. And I want to stop for a moment to tell y'all thank you for praying for me. And, and after all of that that I went through, uh, they went back with the test and they did the test three times. And the test, the number of that test of the cancer was 00.1. 00. Wow. Meaning it's undetected. Hallelujah. Not saying that it was in remission. It said that it was undetected. And they went through all my body to make sure cancer was nowhere else in my body. And there was no cancer found in my body. And I'm just thankful to be here today. Amen. With you all. Amen. So I sing these songs from the bottom of my heart because it's in my heart. Amen. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. I know his eyes is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Amen. And that's one of the songs. But I'm going to sing this song from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all again. We need to hear from you. We need a
TV destruction is now in my view. Seem like this whole world forgotten about you. Children are crying, people are dying, Lord. They're so lost without you. They're so lost without you. You said if we only seek your faith. I'm glad I'm not preaching behind that. <laughs> That's a beautiful day today. I did want to, uh, we do have a couple of prayer requests I really wanted to bring out today. That was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Chacone, not Johnny, his daddy, uh, had a heart attack this week. And uh, I, ho I hope that we'll keep them in our prayers. Uh, as well as Charles over in uh, uh, Vincent, over in Tulia, my head elder there. He had a heart attack this week, too. Uh, so I'd like to keep both those in prayers. You know, Darla's still suffering from the uh, kidney stone or stones or something. So let's keep her. But I think we ought to have a praise, too, because Isaiah, you know, it's a wonderful testimony. Amen. So we're going to have a quick prayer for everybody there, too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for uh, being with us today. But, Lord, we just we want to we want to uplift a few people, Lord, just special because we know how hard it is to uh, go through these medical issues. And Lord, we, you know, we, we have Charles, that's uh, my head elder up in Tulia. Lord, he, he suffered a heart attack this week, and Lord, he's just, uh, he's getting by as, as, uh, as best he can at the moment. And then uh, Mr. Chacon as well. Lord, we, we ask that you be with him as well. He was supposed to go back home tomorrow, but now he's going to be here for a while. But Lord, uh, we also uh, want to uplift Darla as he goes through her, her issues. And Lord, we just ask that you, if there's anyone I forgot, that you be with them as well. But then, Lord, we just want to give a special blessing and a, and a thank you, Lord, for uh, putting your healing hands on his day and making sure that, that he's able to continue to serve you. But Lord, we're just grateful for these things, and we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a couple of quick things. First of all, 
Well, Dr. Chadwick, you did an outstanding job last night. Right, everybody? Yeah. All right. Now, I brought this up because someone came up to me afterwards and said they thought they could do better. Oh. They said he was good, but they thought they could do better. So I, I challenged Kai to come up today and, and, and do a better job. So come on up, Kai. I'm going to give you this, and he's going to, he's going to name off some of these uh, dinosaurs for you. What is that one? Mosasaurus. Is that right, Doctor? Yeah, that's right. What about the next one? That's his horses. That's pretty good. The next one? And T-Rex. That's a T-Rex. That's a big one, isn't it? That's What's that one? Uh, that's a That's good. That's a Caesar's. And this one, we got one more. Buddy's a Caesar's. And Walker. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. I don't know if you can follow that one very well either. <laughs> okay, I have one more thing, and I'm going to let Dr. Chadwick get up here. We announced him yesterday, but there was one special thing. You know, you know me, I love birthdays, right? And I love to embarrass people, and make, especially when it's on that day. Well, this is not just a special day that we get to talk about dinosaurs. But Dr. Chadwick has a birthday today. Oh, happy birthday. And he did make it clear he's not older than the dinosaurs. That's a plus. But he is 75 today. So I would like to sing happy birthday to Dr. Chadwick. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, Dr. Shire, if you come, uh, we do have potluck, and when you're there, we have a special cake for you today. So, Doctor, it's your turn. I'm aware that when I give these kinds of talks, Oftentimes there are people in the audience that are not Christians or are not believers or believe differently than I do. And so I'd like to preface my comments this morning by suggesting this is an opportunity for you to find out why Christians care so passionately about the issue of creation. So if you're not a believer and you're not a Christian, then this is a special opportunity for you to learn. So I hope that uh, I will succeed in that this morning. When God started out his book, he began in Genesis chapter 1 with a very important statement. In the beginning, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. He takes responsibility and ownership of everything, not just the earth, the starry sky, the vast universe, and infinity beyond that are all within his domain. That's a powerful claim. Why is it, do you suppose, that today we find so few who follow that belief? Why is it that you can't watch a television program, you can't watch a, read a newspaper or pick up a magazine that it doesn't talk about billions of years and, and uh, the process of evolution by slow emergence from the slough? Why is that the mantra of today rather than in the beginning God created? I'd like to help us understand that this morning by turning to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28 are two chapters in the Old Testament that tell us a little bit about the nature of this whole conflict that we are involved in. What's bumping here? It's uh, beginning in verse 12. 
We're told some things about someone named Lucifer or Satan. that uh, I think are very relevant for us here. It's talking about a scene that many people in Christendom don't even understand, but one that is clearly enunciated in Scripture. There was a fall that took place in heaven. Now, heaven was a perfect place. God made it so. But something happened. It begins, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How are you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nation? So it's talking about this being named Lucifer. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also be in the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, he says, will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. I want to be like God. I want His character. I want to reflect his love. But that's not what this is talking about. What is it that Lucifer wanted to be like God in? Everything. Power. 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 And where does that power come from? We're told in Matthew chapter 4. Something else about this character named Lucifer, also called Satan. And we're, all, we're told something very significant about him here. Beginning in verse 8. Jesus has gone into the wilderness, being driven there by the Spirit. And he has now spent 40 days and 40 nights without food. I don't know how many of you have spent 40 days and 40 nights without food. How many of you spent a day without food? I hope, I hope that you've gone through that experience a few times. I one time uh, spent a week without food just for the fun of it, to see what it was like, find out what kind of responses my body had to it. Uh, but I've never spent 40 days without food. So what kind of a character is Lucifer? What kind of a character is Satan, his name now? Well, he goes to Jesus after he's not eaten for 40 days and says, go out and make a loaf of bread and eat it. Now, you're the son of God. If you're the son of God, if you're really the son of God, make yourself a loaf of bread and eat it. Would that be a temptation to you today? Well, it's not a temptation to us anyway. But would that be a temptation to Jesus on any given day? No. But after going without food for 40 days, it was a challenge. And he then took him up on top of the temple and said, throw yourself down because God says he's taking, he'll take care of you and you, you should be able to jump off this if you're the son of God. And then his third temptation, and by the way, when I was in high school, I was on the debating team. And we would go around from, this was in Southern California, we'd go, go around from school to school, and we would debate other students, and we'd be given the topics right there at the time, and so we had no time to prepare except to lay out whatever rules we'd learned. And the one rule I remember from that whole experience, by the way, I, I don't favor debates. I think they're, they're very bad because I found out I can take either side of any question and argue for it. But once I've argued for it, I have a vested interest in it. And I'm likely to feel differently about it. So it's, it's kind of a dangerous thing to do. But the one rule I remember is that you save your hardest, strongest argument for last if you want to win a debate. So here he takes him up into an exceeding high mountain. He takes Jesus into an exceeding high mountain. And he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. Now Jesus was born and raised in this little area of, of the Middle East called Palestine. He'd never been outside that region. 
He'd been to Jerusalem, he'd seen the city of Jerusalem, but he didn't know what the rest of the world was like. Now, Jesus was a human being now, fully human, fully divine, but he did not have his divine memory. He didn't have his divine knowledge. He had set that aside in order to be like us. So he'd never seen the kingdoms of the earth. And so Satan takes him up in the high mountain and he causes all the kingdoms of the earth to pass before him. And he tells Jesus, I'll give it all to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. Now there's a lot more in that sentence than meets the eye because what did he mean to give it all to him? It meant that Jesus would not have to go to the cross. He would not have to win this world. It would be given to him if he would just fall down and worship Satan. Seems easy enough. After going without food for 40 days, seems like it would be a real temptation to Jesus. The cross, bearing the world's sins, or a gift. Now why did Lucifer want Jesus to bow down and worship him? Turn with me over to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4 is a, an amazing chapter. In fact, I uh, told my class about it on Thursday in my le lecture. We talked about the fact that God may exist in other dimensions than just the three that we know, and that could easily explain a lot of the things in Scripture. But that amazing chapter ends up like this. The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes, do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Worship and creation go together. You cannot find a reason to worship apart from creation in Scripture. Worship is tied to creation. And even in heaven, worship is tied to the fact that God is our creator. Inside of each one of us, there is put a urgency and a desire to worship that which created us. It expresses itself here this morning in our being here in church to worship God. If God is not our creator, if God is not our creator, we have no business being here this morning. If we don't believe that God is our creator, we have no business being in <coughs> his house to worship him this morning. Interesting. Why did Lucifer want Jesus to bow down and worship him? Because he wanted Jesus to acknowledge Lucifer as his creator. It has something to do with the war in heaven that we really don't know very much about. Worship is farther than that. Turn with me to... Paul's writings over in Romans chapter 1. Very important chapter where Paul introduces the subject of righteousness by faith. It is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith in verse 17. Verse, 9, verse 20. For since, for since the foundation of the world, this is in the context of faith now. For since the foundation of the world, verse 20, since the creation of the world, 
His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody can come to God and say, I didn't know you were the creator. Take a little child out into a field of flowers and ask them who made those flowers. They're not going to have any trouble telling you who made those flowers. Since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, we can't see God. We don't get to look at him. He tried that method, by the way. He tried it on Israel. Did it work? You think if God showed up here this morning, you'd do a better job of worshiping him? Probably. <laughs> for a little while. But it didn't work for Israel. They kept wandering away from him even though he was there in their midst. His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they knew God, they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then this word, which is significant when you think about where the seeds of this insurrection are planted today, in the universities of our land, professing themselves to be wise. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. And what is the glory of the uncorruptible God? It's his creation. His creation is his glory. It's the thing in nature that speaks about God. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of man and flying things and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's the story of evolution right there in Romans chapter 1. They changed creation by God into evolution <coughs> and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. They worshiped and served the creature because every one of us has planted in our hearts the need to worship. And we're going to worship something. We are going to worship something because it's part of our very being. If we do not put that worship on God, if we do not focus our attention on the Creator of the universe, it's going to go somewhere else. And where is that somewhere else? What gave rise to us? Worship is always associated with creation. If we believe that evolution is the pathway of creation, then we're going to worship the creatures. Man and flying things and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's where our worship is going to be associated. We have the choice. It lies with us. But if God is not the creator, if God did not bring us into existence, if we are not <coughs> the property of God through creation, then we have no business worshiping God. We need to turn our worship to whatever it is that we think gave rise to us. So take worship off the table if God's not the creator. That's only the beginning Turn with me over to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 is an amazing chapter. Paul is what we call a heavy writer. When he says stuff, it it's, doesn't just go over the top. It's, it's heavy and deep. Paul is a deep writer, a deep thinker. But in chapter 5, he says the same thing seven different times. Oh he uses the same words seven different times in the same chapter. And although he varies the way he says it, 
It's over and over and over. Do you think it's important that we know what he's saying here? Amen. It must be important. So let's just pick one of them at random. Uh, verse 17 is what he says. If by one man's suffering, one man's offense, I'm sorry, if by one man's offense death reigned through one, what one man is that? What one man offended? Adam. Adam. If by one man's offense, death reigned through that one, death came with sin, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, even Jesus Christ. He says it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in this one chapter. One man brought sin into the world. Therefore, it's fair for one man to redeem us. Did you ever wonder how one man's death, Jesus, can redeem all of us through all time? The answer is right here in chapter 5. We, how many of you ever had a choice about being a sinner? Anybody here had a choice about being a sinner? You were born in sin, conceived in iniquity. You never had the choice. Therefore, it's fair for God by one man, even Jesus Christ, to redeem us. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. But it only makes sense if. It only makes sense if God made a sinless world and put a sinless being in that world and that being chose to disobey. So without the story we find in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, without that story, this whole story of the plan of salvation means nothing. If God did not make a perfect world and put a perfect being in that world who chose to disobey him, then the whole plan of salvation goes away. It's meaningless. Because if God chose evolution as the mechanism to bring us into existence, who's responsible for sin? If we evolved over millions of years from, from other creatures, if we evolved... And, and at some point we became sentient and then we became humans and so on. If this was God's plan, then God is responsible for the world the way it is today. Not man. Because he never had a choice. Because death is the engine of evolution. Death and reproduction are the engines that drive evolution. So the only way the plan of salvation makes sense is if the story in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3 is correct. Isn't that amazing? So we lose a reason for worship. We don't have any business worshiping God if he's not our creator. We lose our understanding of the plan of salvation that Jesus came down to this world, <coughs> this sinful world, to die, to restore Adam. To restore us by taking our own sins on him. <coughs> our sins he bore. Our death he died. And so we have eternal life. But without the Garden of Eden, without the perfect creation, we can't have that story. It doesn't work. It's nonsense. That's not all. We lose. Turn with me over to Exodus chapter 31. Here, God is talking to Moses. Exodus 31, verse 12. 
the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It is that interesting. Sanctification is tied up in the Sabbath. Jumping down to 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made... How many days did he make it in? Six days. Six days. And this is God speaking, this is not Moses. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of stone written with the finger of God written with the finger of God in stone. You know, if I say to you something is written in stone, does that mean something to you? If my son comes to me, this was many years ago, and asks for the car keys because he wants to use it, and I say, no, you can't have it, he's going to say, please, Dad, I need it for blah, blah, blah. And if I say, no, it's written in stone, you're not going to have the car in the night. Does that, is he going to keep trying? No. If it's written in stone, it has to be true. If God wrote in stone that he made the earth in, in seven days, six days, if God wrote in stone with his own finger that he made the earth in six days, if he didn't make the earth in six days, then God's a liar. Or maybe Moses just made this story up and God didn't really say it. What about that? Does that get us off the hook? No, because if Moses made this story up, then Moses is a liar. And what hope do we have that the rest of what he wrote is true? God is really on the line in the creation story. Really on the line. If we give up on God as our creator, if we find some substitute, such as the evolutionary theory, and we take, put that in the place of God and worship that, where are we? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. This is a, a really interesting chapter. It's worth reading the whole chapter. It's got a lot of interesting things in it. But it talks uh, down in around verse uh, 13 and onward, it talks about people trying to hide what they do from God. Woe to those, verse 15, woe to those who hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in, in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely, Isaiah says, you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? My wife is a potter, so I have a close affinity with this. She teaches ceramics at the university. And she takes a lump of worthless clay and puts it on a wheel and builds a beautiful vessel out of it. And, and she's a very good potter. And she has a lot of training in it. And she can make very good vessels. Suppose we treated the potter just the same as the clay. For shall the thing made say to him who made it, he did not make me? What if she made this beautiful pot and the pot turned around and said, you didn't make me? Wouldn't that be absurd? That is absurd. We are the clay. He is the potter. What business do we have turning to God and saying, you didn't make me? That's absurd. Finally, turning back to the verse that was read this morning for scripture reading out of 2 Peter chapter 3. 
By the way, if you think prophecy is an important thing to know about, here's a prophecy that was written 2,000 years ago that's fulfilled in our ears, and it, there's nobody in this audience that can doubt that it's fulfilled. He begins, Beloved, now I write to you this second epistle. This is uh, Peter. And again, this is a, a very touching and moving letter that he's writing here because he's about ready to die. And unlike you and I, Peter knows how he's going to die because Jesus told him, you're going to die on the cross, like me, because you asked for it. <laughs> don't ask for something you don't want. So here is Peter, and remember this outspoken, careless individual is now an old man, and he is sweet-natured and gentle and kind, and the most common word you'll find in this epistle is remember, 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 don't forget, I'm going to be gone shortly, please don't forget the things I've taught you. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, on both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. What's that? The words that were spoken before by the holy prophets. What's that? What do we call that today? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. I know there are people that say, I'm a New Testament Christian, but you know what? If you're going to follow Peter, you're an Old Testament Christian too. Amen. Which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So the New Testament, Old Testament, he says you better know them both. Remember them and don't let them go. Knowing this first, that in the last days, the last days, the last days, there shall come scoffers. Scoffers coming in the last days. Can you imagine that? The last days prophetically began in 1798. The period the Bible calls the, the last days at the end of the 1260 day prophecy began in 1798. So if you live after 1798, you're in the last days. In the last days there shall come scoffers walking after their own lusts, doing the things they want to do, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Jesus is going to come back. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now that might not resonate with you, but it resonates with me because I'm a geologist. And the father of modern geology was a man by the name of Hutton, James Hutton. In 1796, he published his treatise. And in that treatise, in the introduction, he says, When I look into the history of the earth, I see no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Does that fulfill this prophecy? And if you look at James Hutton in the book, you'll find out he is what underlies the modern science of geology, his work. For this they willfully are ignorant of. Willful ignorance means I choose to ignore it, right? If I'm going 95 miles an hour out here on interstate whatever it is, 40, if I'm going 95 miles an hour, it's not because I think that's the speed limit, it's because I choose to ignore it. Amen. Willful ignorance means you know, but you choose to ignore. Did James Hutton know? Yes. Did he choose to ignore? Yes. Willfully ignorant. What are they willfully ignorant of? 
that by the word of God, the world was of old. And the earth standing in the water and out of the water. Where's that coming from? Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Mm -hmm. What's that? The flood. flood. Two things underlie modern geology. One is that it's been infinite in time, and the other, it's a gradual progression. There is no disruption of the process. And this text says these people are going to ignore the Bible and choose to believe that, because the Bible says creation was effectively instantaneous, that God took this planet and fixed it for life and put life on it in one week's time, One week's time. Can you imagine that? Any of you that could do that? (laughs) And then he destroyed the world in a flood. In a flood. A catastrophic process that we use to try to understand the world around us. Because when you look in Grand Canyon, you see all these massive layers of rock that have fossils in them. They must have happened after creation because they have fossils in them. And yet, we don't think it was millions of years ago because life's only been on the earth a few thousand years. So how do we explain these rocks in Grand Canyon by a catastrophic global flood? The two tools that God has given us to understand the world, these people take away. And they leave us with nothing in its place. But the heavens and the earth are, by the same word, preserved for fire until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Well, there's that God of fire and brimstone, that God of fear depicted in this text. But wait a minute, let's read on. (coughs) Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord... A day is is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Is it hard for God to make a world in one day? No. In one week? No. With God, it's all the same. This also tells us God doesn't live in time. Did you ever think that God had time in heaven? Is there a big tick-tock up there in heaven going around? No. God does not live in time. If God lived in time, he would be subject to time, and he wouldn't be God. God lives outside of time. He does not exist in time. (coughs) Don't try to explain me what that is. And I certainly don't understand what it means. But God does not, he is not constrained by time. And I don't think he's constrained by space either. But he's not constrained by time. And so what we think would take thousands of years, God could do like that. Is that right? Am Am I correctly representing him? And then this verse 9. Memorize this verse. Eat it up and make it yours. Because it tells us what kind of a God we serve. Yes, the world is going to be destroyed. Does God want to catch these people off guard that don't believe in him? No. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. God hasn't forgotten that he said he'd come back. He hasn't forgotten you and me. He hasn't forgotten his promise. He's not slack concerning his promise as men count slackness. Again, we've just been told with God a day is is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. God's way of looking at time is different than ours. However, we do live in the time of the end. And very soon... This world and all its contents are going to be burned up. What kind of a God? Listen to this. He's not slack concerning his promise as men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. None of you should perish. The scoffer. He doesn't want the scoffer to perish. He wants to save them. 
He's not slack concerning his promises. Men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. There is no one on this planet that God does not want to save. That's the kind of God I worship and serve. But that all should come to repentance. Is there a promise in that verse somewhere I can claim? What does God want? What is God's will? That I should be saved. That I should be saved and that you should be saved. What an amazing God. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing our closing song, How Majestic Is Your Name. Remind everybody real quick is that we have uh, food in there for you, and at two o'clock we'll come back and uh, uh, Alyssa is going to do a sit-down interview with uh, Dr. Chadwick, but we're also going to give you time to ask your questions as well. I have at least two of them I've already written down waiting to ask you. So uh, join us for that. Join us for his cake in there and a good meal. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we're just truly thankful that we've had the chance to be here. A chance to uh, worship and study, and Lord, we just ask that you be with us as we partake of our food, and then come back, Lord, and finish our program for today. But Lord, we're just truly grateful for you, and we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.